believe we left off <clears throat> right around uh, 1178, which is on page 86 of the PDF. Yocasta has left the stage. She's asked Oedipus to stop searching, to just be quiet, and said, hold on a second, Since some of you are looking. This is, This is around 1153, 1154. It's 1154 in our textbook. Page 1154, sorry. Yocasta says, Man of agony, that is the only name I have for you. That no other ever, ever, ever. She rushes off the stage. And we're told, a long, tense silence follows. The leader of the chorus asks, Where's she gone, Oedipus? Like Oedipus knows, right? Rushing off such wild grief, I'm afraid that from this silence something monstrous may come bursting forth. What's the leader mean? What's the leader want Oedipus to do? Go check on your wife. That's what he wants him to do. He's saying, she was pretty vocal out here. She's, she's being very quiet in the house, in the palace, which is behind them. I'm afraid something monstrous may come bursting forth. Oedipus, let it burst, whatever will, whatever must. I must know my birth, no matter how common it may be. Notice the assumption Oedipus is operating under. He thinks he's low born. He thinks he's like the child of a slave or a servant. I must see my origins face to face. Well, that face just left. She, perhaps she with her woman's pride may well be mortified by my birth. Truer word, truer word was never spoken, but not in the sense that Oedipus means it. But I count myself the son of chance, the great goddess, giver of all good things. I'll never see myself disgraced. Notice how blind he still is. Even though the recognition has begun, he doesn't see yet. Okay? So he says, I'll never see myself disgraced. She is my mother. Who's the she? He's not talking about Yocasta. Chance. He's saying chance is my mother. And the moons have marked me out. My blood brothers, one moon on the way, the next moon great with power. That is my blood, my nature. I will never betray it, never fail to search and learn my birth. So, thinking of Aristotle again, and this idea of amartia, To miss the mark, which again often gets translated as fatal flaw, and, and I'm not saying you should translate it that way, but it often gets translated that way. If Oedipus has this, he has more than one. One of them we've already talked about is his rashness. Another one, which Crayon and two ends? I think so. Crayon and Teresa's mention is his stubbornness. And his third one, or a third one, I'm trying to think out what this one could be his That's a G's, those are G's. Dogged pursuit 
of the truth, if you want. His perseverance for finding out who he is. Okay? So, Chorus then speaks and says, Yes, if I'm a true prophet, if I can grasp the truth, at the full moon of tomorrow, my Kithron, you will know how Oedipus glories in you, you, his birthplace nurse, his mountain mother, blah, blah, blah. They go on and on. They talk about Dionysius and Hermes. Hermes, the messenger of the gods, etc. And <clears throat> someone starts to appear, at least according to the stage directions we're, we see. And Oedipus says, look, okay, I never met the man that is the messenger that Yocasta said, for still, if I had to guess, I'd say that's the shepherd. That's the shepherd who told them Laius was killed by a group of thieves. The shepherd who, as soon as he saw Oedipus in town, wanted to be, you know, shipped off to the farthest part of the kingdom. The very one we've looked for all along. Brothers in old age, two of a kind, he and our guest here. So, he turns to the leader, Oedipus does. Is this is this him? He asks. And the leader, yep, one of Lias's men, trusty shepherd. Okay, so then Oedipus turns to the messenger. Is this the guy who gave me to you? He says, um, that's him. Oedipus now speaks to the shepherd, who's come all the way onto the stage. Did you ever serve King Lias? Yes, I did. What, what did you do? Herded the flocks most of my life. Where? Uh, Kitharon sometimes, hills round about. Do you know this guy? He points to the messenger from Corinth. He looks at him, and he looks at the king. Uh, doing what? Because Oedipus not only said, do you know him, did you ever see him there, that is, at Kitharon? And the shepherd says, doing what? That is, see him doing what there? Uh, what, what do you mean? This guy, right here. Do you ever do anything with him? Have any dealings with him? Uh, not that I could say. Keep in mind, he's old. This was a long time ago. He might have changed. If you were to see a picture of me now, to me, 20 years ago, you wouldn't be able to recognize. I look that different. I, my memory's bad. So the messenger says, What's, you know, it's fitting. It's no wonder that he doesn't recognize me or know me. Let me refresh his memory. So he talks about the old times they had on Mount Kithron, you know, grazing their flocks, etc., etc. And so now he says, the messenger says to the shepherd, that's how it was, wasn't it? Yes or no? He goes, yeah, you know, but it's a long time ago. Do you remember giving me a child? A boy? A little fellow? What? Why rake up that again? Notice the verb, rake. What does that imply? It's been covered over, and when he rakes it, he uncovers something. Messenger. <clears throat> Here's why. Look. This is the boy. This is the baby. And he points to Oedipus. Damn you, shut your mouth. Oedipus, whoa, 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 don't, don't lash out at him. Master, what have I done wrong? You won't answer his questions about the boy? He's talking nonsense, wasting his, so you won't talk willingly. Okay, a little torture will do the trick. The guard seizes the shepherd. No, dear God, don't torture an old man. Twist his arms. God, help us, why? What more do you need to know? Did you give him that child? I did. I wish to God I'd died that day. 
you'll get your wish if you don't tell the truth. Okay? More I tell, the worse the death I'll die. What's the shepherd afraid of? Oedipus. And once Oedipus really knows the truth, the shepherd's afraid. He's going to slowly torture me to death. Our friend here wants to stretch things out, does he? That could be a reference to possible means of torture, pulling him apart, okay? No, 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 I gave it to him, I told you. Where'd you get the boy? Your house? That is, was it your child? Someone else? Uh, not mine, got it from, notice, someone else. Why doesn't he just fess up? You're Elias' son, okay? Which one of them? And Oedipus looks at the chorus. Whose house? No, don't. Don't make me. For God's sake, Master, no more questions. Who is the shepherd protecting? Just himself? Oedipus also. You're a dead man if I have to. He came from the house of Laius. Slave? Notice what Oedipus is doing. He's narrowing down the possibilities. Okay? Slave? Or one of his own children? I'm right at the edge of the horrible truth. I've got to say it. That is, I can't. And I'm at the edge of hearing horrors. Yes, but I must hear. What is the horror Oedipus is afraid to hear? That he, what is the, the horror Oedipus thinks he's afraid to hear? I'm born of a slave. It, it hasn't entered his mind yet that he's Laius' son. All right, his son, they said it was his, Lysus, his son. But the one inside, your wife, she'd tell it best. In other words, let me go and hear straight from the proverbial horse's mouth. My wife, she gave it to you? Yes, yes, my king. And the light is starting to, you know, the dimmer is going up. Why? What for? To kill it. Her own child? How could she? She was afraid. Frightening prophecies. And that bulb that's been about 5, 10, 15 watts is now hitting 75, 100 watts. It's getting pretty bright in Oedipus's mind. What? They said he'd kill his parent. But you give, why'd you give him to this man? What is... Possibly, Oedipus starting to think at this point. Possibly. No evidence for it. Well, a little bit. I should have died. I should have died then. Rather than what's been going on for the last 20 or 30 years. I pitied the little baby. Hoped he'd take him off to his own country, far away saved him, but he saved him for this, this fate. Notice, he doesn't say he saved you. He's still speaking of the baby in third person. He saved him for this fate. <coughs> if you, notice the conditional, if, the shepherd isn't saying you are. If you are the man he says you are, believe me, you were born for pain. Telling us what? What is Oedipus's purpose for existence? Pain. That's it. He was only born to experience pain. Oh, God, all come true, all burst to light, all come true, all the prophecies 
the prophecies or the prophecy Elias and Jocasta heard and the prophecy Oedipus heard. Fully true. I did kill my father. I did marry my mother. I did sleep with my mother. And I did bring forth a brood of children that should never see the light of day. I stand revealed at last. Back up. All burst to light. O light, now let me look my last on you. Let me look with these eyes. Notice, he was blind before, but now he sees. O light, now let me look my last on you. I stand revealed at last. That is, I was hidden before. And why does, again, why does all of this happen? Think of what I said about tragedy last Friday. You know, I kind of gave you my definition of it. It's when a protagonist has to make a decision, take an action, without having all of the necessary information. If he had known, when I had you know written over here in the Delphi, if he had known when he went to Delphi that Polybus and Merope were not his parents, and he heard the prophecy, what would he have done? I think it's pretty safe to say. He would have gone back to Corinth. If he knew they were not his parents. Why? Because if he went back to court, there would be no chance of killing his parents. Unless they came and visited him, you know, for some reason. <clears throat> so, Oedipus rushes through the doors. Notice your is still inside. Chorus. Oh, the generations of men, the dying generations, adding the total of all your lives, I find they come to nothing. Does there exist, is there a man on earth who sees it's more joy than just a dream, a vision? Notice what the chorus is doing. Okay? And bear in mind, all the... Every time after the first entrance of the chorus, in what's called the parados, right? You know, there's five um, components of a tragic play. And when the chorus first comes in, that's the parados. And the chorus is on the stage at that point. And as they're making their way and they're talking, they're making their way across, and then they go down into the orchestra which is this round place in front of the stage. So whenever the chorus speaks from that point on, all of their stasing moans, plural, whatever it is, all of their stasimos, all the chorus's speeches, are made down in that orchestra, that round place, all right? The leader probably comes up onto the stage when he speaks with Oedipus or, or whomever. So, Every time the chorus speaks, after that parados, even including it, they're doing what? They're commenting on, commenting on what has just been said, and they're foreshadowing. They're kind of leading our minds to what is going to be said. So what is the chorus? Just think of that, those lines that I just read. Oh, the generations of men, the dying generations. Adding the total of all your lives, I finally come to nothing. Does there exist? Is there a man on earth who sees it more joy than just a dream of vision? And the vision no sooner dawns than dies, blazing into oblivion. So they take Oedipus's life, Oedipus's story, and they extrapolate to all of us. This is our life. Why? In the Greek cosmological vision, the Greek cosmological worldview, we live for a little bit and then we die. And our lives are characterized by what? Because of the interaction of humanity with fate on one side and the gods on the other. Pain. That's all we're here for. Pain. Sorrow. So, you are my great example. You, your life, your destiny, Oedipus, man of misery. They say, in Oedipus, we actually see all human lives. 
It's just his is raised, so to speak, his suffering to the nth degree. He suffers more than anybody. That's why they say, man of misery. And then they finish that little part. I count no man blessed. Question is, would others agree? Would Polybus agree? Polybus seemingly didn't have such a bad life. Okay. Crayon, so far, hasn't had too bad a life. Yeah, his brother-in-law has gone a little off the deep end and accused him of things. So, the chorus goes on, and a messenger comes back in. We're going to skip the rest of Messenger comes in. Men of Thebes, always first in honor, what, sorrow, what horrors you will hear, what you will see, what a heavy weight of sorrow you will shoulder, if you are true to your birth, if you still have some feeling for the royal house of Thebes. Okay? Talks about pain and suffering, sorrow. Leader. God knows we have pains enough already. Right? Because Thebes is dying. Has, has the curse been fulfilled? Has what Apollo demanded been done yet? No, it hasn't. Oedipus is still there. The murderer of Laius is still there. So the leader says, we have pains enough already. What can you add to them? You know, our, our cup of pains is overflowing. The queen is dead. How? By her own hand. She ran inside and killed herself. Why? Ew. <laughs> That's why. One word. E-W. She realized just before she ran inside who Oedipus was. What did she call him again? Man of Agony, or protagonist, first in suffering, chief sufferer, by your own hand. But you're spared the worst, you didn't have to see it, I saw it all. And in, in all Greek tragedy, all deaths, all murders, all what Oedipus does to himself happen off the stage. It happened behind closed doors. Why? It was thought to be too much for an audience to handle. Compare that with, you know, Saw, whatever, 14, or Nightmare. <laughs> Our society says, seemingly, has a mentality of more gore the better. Theirs was not any gore, none on the stage. It all happened. And it's because it was called a spectacle. In all spectacles, outside. Okay? So, once she'd broken in through the gates, dashing past this frantic whip to fury, tipping her hair out with, ripping her hair out with both hands, she ran into her room, flinging herself across the bridal bed, that is, the bed she slept with Oedipus in. Okay? Door slamming behind her, she wailed for Laius, dead so long ago, remembering how she bore his child, the life that rose up to destroy him, blah, 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 blah. And what does she do? She gets the sash that she wore around her gown, slings it up over a beam, and hangs herself. Hanging is not necessarily a quick death. Unless you get dropped, you know, through the gallows trap door. Oh, how she wept, mourning the marriage bed where she let loose that double brood, double brood, monsters, husband by her husband, child, children by her child, etc. Okay? Oedipus comes running in. He sees her dead, we're told. He was raging, 1390, one of the dark powers pointing the way, none of us mortals crowding around him. No. He hurled at the twin doors, bending the dolts back. 
out of their sockets, crashed through the chamber. By the way, that's foreshadowing. Oedipus goes in, wrenches the doors out of their sockets, meaning the hinges. Why? Because there are going to be some other sockets referred to in just a moment. There we saw the woman hanging by the neck, etc. Oedipus goes up to her swaying body and pulls off of her breast, okay, her gown, these two pins that she has pinning the cloth together, pulls them off, opens a stick pin him in his eyes, <laughs> gouges his eyes out, but all off the stage. Notice this guy is narrating. It's okay to hear about it, you just can't see it, okay? He points, he looks straight up into the points, digs them down, etc., and cries, you, 1405, you'll see no more the pain I suffered. That is, you damned eyes. <laughs> you won't see any more. The pain I suffered, all the pain I caused. Too long you looked on the ones you never should have seen, meaning his children, not his mother slash wife. Blind to the ones you long to see, to know. Blind from this hour on. Blind in the darkness. Blind. Why? Because all throughout the play, up to that point, Oedipus thought he was the one who saw the most clearly. And now... Because he knows he was blind, now he's going to be physically blind. But, spiritually if you want, mentally, now he sees. These are the griefs that burst upon them both. Now in this one day, 1418, wailing, madness, and doom, death, disgrace, all the griefs in the world that you can name. All are theirs forever. Why? Because Oedipus and Yocasta go down to Hades, the place of the dead, not the Christian conception of hell. Okay? It's not torment and suffering. It's just the most boring place in the world where there's no joy, no happiness, no pleasure. It's just all sighing, okay? And forever they will experience what the messenger has just talked about. Oh, poor man, the misery. Has he any rest from pain now? Okay? The leader's asking, has Oedipus finally gotten over the pain? No, he hasn't. And the chorus is going to tell us why when we get to the very end of the play. Messenger, he's shouting. Okay. The door is open. Oedipus comes out. And the messenger says, you are about to see a sight of horror even his mortal enemy would pity. And Oedipus comes blinded, led by a boy terror, the suffering for all the world to see, the worst terror that ever met my eyes, what madness swept over you. Now, that might be referring to just gouging his eyes out. It might be referring to a whole bunch of actions that we see throughout the play. And it might be referring to pretty much all of Oedipus's actions going back to murder of lies. What God, what dark power left beyond all bounds, beyond belief, to crush your wretched life? Notice what the chorus is saying. It's not Oedipus's fault. It's some God, some dark powers. I pity you, but I can't bear to look. I have much to ask, so much to learn. Oedipus. The agony, I am agony. Notice he doesn't say I'm in agony. 
He says, I am suffering personified. Where am I going? Where on earth? Where does all this agony hurl me? Where is my voice? Etc. Etc. What is my destiny? Etc. Chorus, to the depths of terror, to dark, to hear, to see. Oedipus repeats what the chorus says. Uh, they go back and forth. Oedipus addresses the chorus as a friend. He says, you show compassion, loyal to the last. I know you're here. Chorus, it's dreadful what you've done. Oedipus addresses Apollo. Line one, uh, 1465. How could you bear it, gouging out your eyes? What superhuman power drove you on? Apollo, friends, Apollo. He ordained my agonies. That's not true. Oedipus is blaming Apollo. Apollo didn't ordain. Apollo didn't cast into stone that at some point in time, Lies and Yocasta will have a child and that child will do X, Y, and Z. All Apollo did was relate that that was going to happen. He didn't cause it to happen. Or did he by giving the prophecy? In other words, by hearing the prophecy, did that cause Oedipus to fulfill it? If Oedipus had never heard the prophecy, what would he have done? He wouldn't have run away from Corinth. If Yocasta and Laius, Laius had never heard the prophecy, what would they have done? Wouldn't have nailed his feet together, wouldn't have sent him off to Mount Kithron, etc. But that implication then is Oedipus still would have been raised and still would have fulfilled the prophecy. In other words, the prophecy would just have been fulfilled another way, with Oedipus still being the agent of it. The details would have been different. Okay. He ordained my agonies, these my pains on pains, but the hand that struck my eyes was mine, mine alone. I did it to myself. Why? What good were eyes to me? Nothing I could see could bring me joy. Chorus, no, that's pretty clear. What can I ever see? And notice what Oedipus is suggesting sight is for. Or he's almost suggesting. What love, what call of the heart can touch my ears with joy? What joy can I see? In other words, sight, he's implying, should bring joy, comfort, solace. And if all you see is metaphorically, his children's faces, brothers and sisters' faces, you, his mother slash wife's face, you, his father's face that he killed, um, yeah, I'd probably want to take my eyes out too. So, he goes on. Nothing, friends, take me away, far, far from Thebes, quickly cast away my friends. Why? Because that will be the fulfillment of the curse he called down on the murderer of Elias. This great murderous ruin, this man cursed to heaven, the man the deathless gods hate most of all. Okay? Do we know the gods hate Oedipus? Have we heard Apollo say, I hate you, Oedipus? No, we haven't. That's an assumption Oedipus is making. Why? Because of his suffering. What do many people, if not most, if not all people, when something really, really, really horrendous happens out of the blue, whether they believe in him or not? Why me, God? Why me, universe? It's the same question. Oedipus is saying, because that out there hates me. Kind of like the misfit thought. Okay? So, Oedipus says, oh, and by the way, the guy who cut my ankles free, 
Philip. Kill him. That damn shepherd, he should die too. Because if he hadn't let me live, none of all this would have happened. Okay? I'd never have come to this. I wouldn't have been my father's murder, my mother's blah, blah, blah. All right? So he asks, um, so he says, why else did he blind himself? So that when he went down into death, when he finally dies, he won't be able to do what? See his father and mother. He'll be physically blind. Okay? Moreover, he won't be able to look at his children. So this big, long speech that he gives, talked about marriage, talked about his children, talked about Polybus and Corinth, etc., etc., and um, and if the signals to the chorus and they back away, Crayon comes in. Then the leader tells him to talk to Crayon. Why? Because 1552, now that he's the sole defense of the country in your place. Oedipus is no longer king. Excuse me. Yocasta is no longer queen. Who's in charge? Crayon. Oedipus, what can I say to him? I mean, I accused him of the murderer I did. I haven't come to mock you, Oedipus, or to criticize your former failings. That is, I'm not here to gloat. And he speaks to the chorus. Have you lost all respect for human feelings? At least revere the sun. Don't expose a thing of guilt and holy dread. In other words, take Oedipus inside. People shouldn't be seeing him. Okay? Kindred alone should see a kinsman's shame. Well, who is kindred? Oedipus's. His children in crayon. That's it. Okay? So... Oedipus says, I, I have one more request. Crayon, really? Why so insistent? In other words, Oedipus, your time for request, man. It's gone. Go, just one. Drive me out of the land at once, far from sight, where I can never hear a human voice. He goes, I would have done that already. For up to me, I would have done that. But I wanted to see what the god said. See, Crayon's kind of acting pretty wise. Before we go off half-cocked, let's see what the oracle says. Oedipus, the god, his command was clear, every word. Really? Oedipus wasn't the one who heard the oracle of Delphi. Crayon was. He said, destroy me, Crayon, so he did. Still, such a crisis, I want to get the exact wording right. You would consult a man, the God, about a man like me? He goes, yeah. See, that's Oedipus's problem. One of Oedipus's problems. He acts seemingly on behalf of the gods. Remember when he said, you pray to the gods, pray to me instead? Kind of overstepping his bounds. So, Crayon says, yes, I will. And you will obey him, right? Yes. And you. Bury the woman inside. That is your sister. It's the only decent thing. As for me, never let Thebes house my body. That is, even when I'm dead, don't bury me here. Okay? He says, here's one thing I know. 1594. No sickness can destroy me. I'm, I'm not going to die next year of, you know, plague or illness. Nothing can. I would never have been saved from death. I have been saved for something great and terrible, something strange. Well, let my destiny come and take me on its way. And within the Sophocles trilogy, that's true. Oedipus lives to a ripe old age. 
and then dies. So he says, one more thing. Let me see my daughters. Well, feel my daughters, since he can't see anymore. So his two daughters, Antigone and his many, are brought in. And Crayon says, my doing, I thought you should see them, talk to them before you go. Okay? So Oedipus addresses them. And he tells Crayon, you're the only father they have now. Take care of them, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Oedipus and Crayon go back and forth a little bit. And then Oedipus is led away. And the chorus gets the final speech. People of Thebes, my countrymen, look on Oedipus. And look on doesn't just mean look at or watch. It means mark or take note of. Learn from Oedipus is what it really means. He solved the famous riddle of the, with his brilliance. He rose to power, a man beyond all power. Who could behold his greatness without envy? See, and in Aristotle's poetics, Aristotle says, that the protagonist must be someone most people would look up to and have some envy for. That most people would look at and go, oh man, to be in his shoes. Before the fall. <laughs> okay. Now what a black sea of terror has overwhelmed him. Now as we keep our watch and wait the final day. Remember what the parson and minister's black veil talked about repeatedly? There is an hour to come when we must all cast aside our veils and we need to be ready for when that hour is, meaning our deaths. Now as we keep our watch, not talking about watching over the city of Thebes, talking about watch over our lives, and wait the final day, the individual days, of our own deaths, count no man happy till he dies, free of pain at last. No one will be happy, or another translation reads, blessed, until he's dead. Why? Because there's no pain anymore. Once you're dead, uh, the pain is gone. Right now, <coughs> what kind of attitude towards life does that express? Yeah, it really, you know, it has no meaning. We're we're what? We're either governed. You know, I had up here the other day. We're either governed or controlled by chance or fate. Either one of those means ultimately life what? Sucks. If it's fate, then we have no control over what we do. If it's chance, we also have no control over what we do. We have no free will. All right? Now look. Ten minutes. We'll start. Antigone. Okay, it's not in the book, so you had to print it out. Okay, Antigone, <clears throat> a lot of time has passed since Oedipus the king. And the play begins after a war. And in the war, one of Oedipus's sons, Eteocles, died defending Thebes. He was the acting as king. Died defending Thebes against one of his brothers, Polynices, who was attacking Thebes. He was attacking Thebes because he wanted to be king. Okay? They both killed each other in battle. Eteocles, we're going to be told in the story, in the play, Eteocles was given full military honors burial, like Arlington National Cemetery. President, Congress, everybody was there. 
Polynices, we're going to be told very quickly, his body was left out in the open to rot and to be eaten by birds and dogs and such. Because in the Greek system, the Greek um, worldview, if the body wasn't buried, the soul would never be at peace. All right? Which is why, if you've ever read the Iliad by Homer, when Achilles kills Hector, he not only kills him, he then ties his body to the back of his chariot, and he drags his body around and around and around the battlefield until bits and pieces start to fall off. He finally stops, and Priam comes to him in the middle of the night, begging for mercy for his son, who's already dead. And Achilles breaks down and agrees. Keep in mind, Achilles is part god. He's a demigod, right? Achilles agrees, and they're allowed to gather up the pieces of Hector's body and have a burial. Why? So that Hector's soul will rest in peace, right? Polynices' body is not buried. It, he can't rest in peace. That's the setting at the opening of the play. So, you've got a little time and scene, you know, giving us the setting. We have the characters, Antigone. We saw Antigone at the very end of the previous play. She was a little girl then. Now she's in her 20s, probably. Late teens, early 20s. She has a sister, Ismene. Okay. We have the chorus. Crayon, we already saw. He is now king. All right? Why wasn't he king when Ateocles was king? Because Ateocles was the son of Oedipus. Primogenitor. Uncle gets pushed off to the side. All right? And then we have a century. We have Haman, who is Crayon's son. Tiresias shows up again. We have a messenger. And we have Eurydice, the wife of Crayon. And Antigone says, my own flesh and blood, dear sister, dear as many, how many griefs our father Oedipus handed down. And it's almost like she's saying, all this blank that happens to us, it's because of dad. Do you know one, I ask you, one grief that Zeus will not perfect for the two of us? What does perfect mean? Make complete, make complete total. It's like, you know, you can have grief that's 75% bad. She said, no, 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 no. Every grief we have, Zeus is going to wring the ultimate amount out of it while we still live and breathe. That is, until we die. There's nothing, no pain. Our lives are pain. And you've got a footnote. Okay, so she says, have you heard about the law? Have you heard about what Crayon has decreed? Ismene, huh, no, what? Okay, she says, I thought so. I, I didn't think you knew, that's why I brought you here. They're, notice, past the gates. They're outside the city of Thebes. I brought you out here so that we could talk. What's the matter? What's so? Crayon, graced one with all the rights, and this we start to get the backstory, the exposition. The Teocles buried with full military honors and such, but the body Polynices, she says, he doesn't get to be buried. A citywide proclamation forbids anyone to bury him, even mourn him. That is, even if she were to sit by his body with tears, that would be illegal. How illegal, capital punishment, to even cry for his death would be cause for her death, okay? Such, I hear, is the martial law. Our good crayon, line 37, lays down for you and me. Yes, me, I tell you. And he's coming here to alert the informed. That is, crayon is getting ready to leave the palace and now make this decree public. 
It hasn't been made public yet, okay? So its meaning says, what can we do about that? Decide. Will you share the labor, share the work? What labor, what work? Will you help me bury polydices? See, bury doesn't mean six feet lead container or cement container or coffin. It just means sprinkling dust over the body and saying the prayers. That's it. Just body can still be totally visible. Just sprinkle a few grains of dust and say the prayers. What, what do you mean? Will you lift up his body with these bare hands and lower it with me? Now, that sounds like she's talking about full burial. She's not, though. What, you'd bury him when a law forbids the city? Yes. So notice what we immediately get introduced to. What's the conflict? Okay, what's... What's the ultimate conflict? The state in the form of Crayon's law versus the individual. And the individual's responsibility to what? The gods, God, justice, what is morally right versus what is legally right. Because the state says what is legally right. The individual says what is morally right. How many of you agree 100% with every law in the United States? I sure as hell don't. Even something silly like 35 miles an hour on Middle Tennessee Boulevard. That street should sure as hell be faster than 35 miles an hour. But that's the law. Okay? Can I break that law? Sure I can. I might get caught. Pay the consequences. So, yes. He's my brother. Deny it as you will. Your brother too. No one. Notice what she's saying. No one will ever convict me for a traitor. Now what does she mean by no one will convict me for a traitor? A jury of our peers will never say she ought to die. Crayon is expressly in Antigone interrupts her. He has no right to keep me from my own. She's saying there is another law. And that law is higher than this law. Is many think, sister. Think how our father died. Hated his reputation and ruin. So this is after. Oedipus dies in the play Oedipus at Colonus. Driven on by the crimes he brought, now look, look, look at us, she says. We're all alone. Think what a death we'll die. Worst of all, if we violate the laws and override the fixed decree of the throne. Remember, another major theme. You women ought to really like this. We are women. We're not born to contend with men. Why? Greek society. Women had no power. Women had no voice. They were not citizens. We're underlings, ruled by much stronger hands. So we must submit in this, and things still worse. I'll be talking about four sex. I'll beg the dead to forgive me. That is, when I die, and she's kind of implying, hopefully in a ripe old age, and I go down and I see Polynices, I'll say, Bro, forgive me. You know, but what am I going to do? I can't go against the law. I'm forced. I have no choice. In other words, I have no what? No free will. And we're back to that. Antigone. We'll stop there. Hopefully I'll be over all this crud by Friday.